them, but yeah, they can tell you a little bit more about what they do. Uh, I'm Mike Messersmith. I'm the general manager for a brand called Oatly. Uh, we make a vegan plant-based milk entirely out of oats, um, and we just launched here in the United States this year. Swedish company. It's been around for over 25 years, um, and just just getting the business going over here. My name is John Mills. I'm a partner and chief strategy officer for a company called Seal the Seasons. We sell locally grown frozen produce. And the idea is really simple. 50 years ago, um, you get all your strawberries when the strawberries are fresh. You stick them in your freezer and you freeze them and you have strawberries all year. You'd have local strawberries or blueberries or whatever it would be. We freeze local strawberries on a state by state basis and sell them year round, making uh, a market for farmers that otherwise wouldn't have a market year round. My name is Cam. I'm founder and CEO of Seed Sheet. We're an ag tech startup out of Vermont, and we like to call ourselves the Blue Apron of Garden Egg. We started on Kickstarter, this past year went on the Shark Tank, and it's been a very caffeinated ride. <laughs> Hello everyone, so my name is Kunil Tolovac. I'm the founder and CEO of Eat Cultures, and we are passionate about microbes, you know, already that, and fruit additions. So I have a PhD in microbiology, and I started to get really, really interested in how we could extend the you know, reach of traditional food fermentation, and how we could start to ferment food products that are not necessarily traditionally fermented to really unleash their full nutritional values or, or taste. Um, so we launched the company about two years ago, went through Kickstarter as well, and we launched our first product not too long ago, which is a fermented coffee, and I'll tell you a bit more about that. So the title of today's talk is What's Old is New Again, and what, what's really interesting about all four of your products is that they kind of turn conventional ideas around the category that you're working in, kind of uh, turn them on its head. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about what the kind of gap was in the market and how the technology, uh, how you use technology to not only create your product, but also get the product into the hands of the consumers. Um, and you guys can kind of talk amongst yourselves. Okay, I'll start. So, yeah, so food fermentations are not really new, right? You know, we have like 7,000 years of history with, with fermented food. And the first cheese were actually not probably made in, in France, but in, in Poland, so just, just so you know. Uh, but what has changed really, really recently in the past 10 years is the tool that we have to prove and understand, you know, microbes. Um, so what I realized during my, my studies and, and my, my PhD was that we could really start to select very specific microbes, natural microbes that could do really interesting things on, 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 on flavor and on, on the initial value of, of, of you know, much broader categories than, than just the traditionally fermented fruit. Uh, so, yeah, so the first product is a coffee, um, and on coffee what we do is we add a fermentation step just before roasting, as a way to make it much, much healthier. So a lot of people struggle with um, digesting coffee, and microbes can help here. They can, you know, chew away the molecules that are responsible for the acidity and, and the irritants. Um, and we also make it, um, I guess, more accessible, kind of a hybrid in taste between a coffee and a tea. Uh, moving forward, you know, we're using again like uh, natural fermentation as a way to upcycle one of the biggest waste in the food industry, which is spent grain, which is the leftover malt uh, uh, after brewing. Um, and we use our, our natural fermentation as a way to uh, recover all the really interesting plant-based clean protein that are in, 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 um, in spent grain and, and make a very interesting uh, protein powder. Mm, sorry protein powder, making them to smoothies and other you know, things. So we're looking into expanding, you know, the reach of, of uh, traditional food fermentation using, you know, modern tools. Um, I think from our perspective here in ag tech, there's definitely a lot of other companies getting into the space right now. It's a really flourishing field. And we like to say that at CG, with the ag back in ag tech, where there's a lot of other companies out there that are going for more pure automation, rather than what our focus is, which is notification. And we liken ourselves to the blue apron of agriculture in the sense that we're trying to empower the home customer to not only grow their food, but correlate that food to a finished recipe. So instead of a garden that has sensors in there that's going to automate, in an automated way, recognize that it needs more moisture and then self-water, we have a notification system that's just going to text you and say, hey, you should probably water your garden right now. There's a video on how to do it. So we're empowering the home with the customer to actually have that ownership over their garden in the sense that we're actually giving you a new skill set rather than just doing everything for you. And your product actually is 
can you explain a little bit more about kind of the innovation piece of it? Because sure. I think people probably are familiar with maybe getting like a package of seeds that tell you how to grow your own salad, but the, the technology that you guys do is a little bit more specific. Yeah, so what we do is we have these dissolvable pods like laundry detergent pods, but instead of soap, ours have organic non-GMO seeds and a buffer of soil. And that's embedded within a weed blocking fabric. And so all that you have to do is put that sheet seed side down on top of a container of soil or soil based on hydro. And once you water it, those pods will dissolve, the seeds will sprout, they'll pop up through that weed blocking fabric, and the result is the perfectly designed and spaced weedless garden. And to that point of us being in the blue apron side of it is we have different recipe inspired kits. So it's grow your own salad kit, taco kit, cocktail kit, hot sauce kit as well as customizable ones on our website. And a cocktail kit. The cocktail kit. It was on the bar there last night. It's delicious. So what we're doing at Seal the Seasons is we're trying to become a national, local brand, which sounds like an oxymoron. And, but we're trying to become a national brand with local product. And to do that, we're really flipping the supply chain on its head. Typically what you have in the food industry is you have a hub and spoke model where you have a hub in one central place and then everything goes out in every direction from the hub. What we do is we are creating several 40 micro hubs all over the country and each, each little hub allows us to have local food in a local area. Um, and it's technology based in that, that the management of it is to manage both the, the distribution but also really important the quality control and quality assurance is it's all tech based we have to be able to know where our product is at all times knowing because in a particular area we might be working in north carolina for example we have 34 farmers that we're working with and we need to be able to test all of their product on a crop by crop basis every time that we uh we bring it to the um, production facility so does that mean that you kind of cut out intermediaries between the farmer and the, and the packaging and processing of the uh, vegetables? In fact, the, the farmers are, are the intermediaries. The farmer, typically we will work with the largest family farmer in an area and he or she will do the, the freezing for all the other farms in that area, in that That's micro hub. So you actually provide the, the hardware, the technology to the, or, or at least provide the, the software, not the hardware. Oh, the software. Uh, the, usually there's already existing capacity and that farm is typically freezing for themselves. We're bringing them a whole network where that network will then freeze, will all be frozen at one central place. Cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so oats are very ancient. Uh, I mean, I think most people have that association with men wearing powdered wigs and oats. Um, but our, our origin story, we were a Swedish company. Um, we were founded about 25 years ago out of an academic research laboratory that was studying, I mean, Sweden is a very progressive culture on many, many topics, but climate change and sustainability is one of the foremost of those. And so there was an academic research project uh, centered on the intersection between lactose intolerance and climate change. The dairy industry is monstrous in Sweden, even more so than it is here in the United States. And the food and beverage industry as a whole, and the dairy industry in particular, um, contribute a disproportionate impact to climate change and greenhouse gases and those sorts of things. And so if you have this consumer need around lactose intolerance and, and different issues there, and you have trying to solve for things around sustainability, the study was around well, what would be the source ingredient where we could both deliver a nutritious product that was really good for people, it was tasty, and um, it was going to be very sustainable to source and maintain. And so looking at the full spectrum of options from tree nuts to legumes to anything, oats emerged as the abundant, sustainable crop that uses very little water, pesticides, um, and we could then take and really work hard to develop a, a intricate process to turn those oats into a liquid oat milk, um, which is done through a very technical and sciencey enzymatic process of literally liquefying the oats, not pressing them, straining them, extracting them or anything like that, but using those to preserve the inherent nutritional value of the oats while also making a creamy and delicious um, product that people could enjoy on their cereal or in a cold glass with dinner.
I mean, I think I can imagine as for food entrepreneurs up here, one of the primary challenges you have is actually around communicating what your product is. Um, you're kind of competing against uh, very established industries like frozen foods, coffee, uh, traditional like seeds or the dairy industry, but also you have very differentiated uh, products to actually sell consumers. So um, can you talk a little bit about the strategies that you guys have to actually talk about what you're doing um, and, and whether or not it makes sense to kind of take this more established traditional industries head on or really try to like define a new whole new category of product? Like I can jump in real quick and say that with gardening, it is an industry that is specifically in the past been for 65 year old women. And we and are. Me. <laughs> and, well, and obviously the quickest growing gardening demographic right now is urban millennials. And so it's very easy for us to differentiate our messaging and our branding from the old, you know, guard of gardening by simply using Instagram, using influencer marketing. Um, we have notifications where your garden will send you text messages as it grows. So just catering our technology and our branding to the demographics that we are trying to reach, which are entirely different from what's in the past period. Well, I think it's really interesting that you call yourself the blue apron of seeds or blue apron of marketing because I'm oh, sorry, of gardening because um, when we met maybe a year ago, I think that the product was really still focused on like the seed piece of it, and now you're really like selling a whole food. Package. And so can you talk a little bit about the decision to start kind of moving in that direction? Yeah, definitely. I think that our, we launched in Home Depot even before we had gone in this new direction. And the reality there was we had taken a pretty utilitarian approach of this is a product that makes it easy to grow plants. <laughs> and people were like, cool, why does it cost so much? <laughs> so our, you know, realization was that in terms of trying to reach the fastest growing gardening segment, there needed to be a better correlation to what they wanted. And that was healthy local food, food transparency. And so we retweaked not necessarily the products themselves, because we're still using the same innovative materials and technology. We just switched the type of plants that we were growing, made sure that they worked well in a curated recipe focus, and then just we we did our dialogue and positioning on that, so it would be... And the branding, too, right? And the branding, exactly. Yeah. I think you said that actually really well. Healthy local food and transparency. Um, that's what we're selling, and it hasn't been difficult. Um, I, mean, I know business is always difficult, and sales always have challenges, but we look at virtually every supermarket in the country right now, and they're all running a campaign about are the champions of local and local farmers. In reality, they have, you know, they're championing local farmers four to six weeks a year when that crop that they have is in season, and then they have nothing. And so we're going out to a category that, in the frozen produce category, that really hasn't seen change, like, like since my grandmother was shopping in frozen produce. Um, other than the introduction of organic in conventional supermarkets 20 years ago, this category seen no change. And so by bringing local produce to that section, um, we're welcomed very much so because we can help them with the supermarket's mission. So what we try and do is really align ourselves with the mission of the supermarket um, as they're trying to champion these family farmers. And we see that coming from the other side, consumers want local produce and they want transparency. And we can provide both. I think starting a new category is really hard. I mean, when I told my parents uh, that I was working for an oat milk company, they were like, oh, goat milk. And I'm like, no, not goat milk. They're like, oatmeal. And I'm like, no, not oatmeal, oat milk. And they're like, I don't understand those two words together. Um, and so there is like, I mean, we have different strategies around like how we, like if anyone's at our booth, we have like a taxonomy for how we explain the idea and like break it down step by step. People like to experience products like in situation, like in a great cup of coffee. Um, but I would also say that like we, uh, I agree with the idea of transparency in our brand and the way we try to introduce complex subjects like an oat milk brand committed to, you know, positive virtue and climate change. 
is we're pretty talky. Like we write a lot. Like our the side panels, we write really long copy things of our, our packaging because consumers are really smart and consumers that are wanting to try new products want that information. And I think a lot of brands fall into a trap of trying to like distill their essence down into these like somehow like hashtag size like nuggets of, of things that like don't give consumers the credit for reading. And if a consumer doesn't want to read our side panel, like that's cool too. Like maybe you won't buy our product, but for the t three out of 10 that do, we feel like they're gonna love our brand because you really, really articulate what our belief system is, our values, and a lot of that does run in conflict with Big Dairy or Trina plant-based milk products that are not, like they're selling product, but it's not good for the environment. and. We have values and we have belief systems, so we just like try to say it. You know. Yeah, and I think for us, you know, transparency has been key as well. And so one of the things that we did is that, you know, I think that there's been kind of a, a real shift in people's mind towards and you know uh, ideas towards microbes. You know, like you, you, if you talk if you talked about microbes ten years ago, like everyone would be disgusted. And, and um, but I think you know people have really changed. You know, and people are starting to seek fermented products and, and kombucha has really helped and you know craft beer as well and uh, the rise of, 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 of cheese in, in the US as well. So I think you know people are ready to hear about fermentations and we, we do that. So we, we put the process up front, you know, the brand is cultured. Uh, one of our, if you, if you walk around um, the floor and you see a stand, you know, it's written in, in big part to the microbes. So we don't hide the, um, the fermentation process, we put it up front as a way to really interact with with, with consumers and that brings me to the second point I think which is you know I think for a food tech brand to, to really uh, succeed you know what it needs to be good at is uh, gaining trust from, from its consumers and so we are very very open about what we're doing what microbes can do what they cannot do so we launched on Kickstarter and, and, and that was kind of a, as a way uh, to have kind of a direct uh, communication channel with the first consumers um, and you know we kind of still refine and experiment with this kind of like open innovation approaches to to launching products and interacting with our community. So for example, for the um, for the, the, the clean plant-based protein powder that I that I mentioned, uh, we are crowdsourcing some of the, the development steps. So we you know our community is is, um, is giving us feedback on different product uh, iteration, and so we kind of want to keep on. Uh, refining the product with, with everyone and have these uh, channels of communication around what Microsoft can do. Really. Yeah, and I'd love to kind of continue that conversation around transparency and also kind of how you position your brand within a larger marketplace. Um, and this is something that Mike had mentioned was really about packaging. So, um, you know, how that uh, product sh sits on the shelf, where it sits, how it looks next to um, other products within that category or not. Um, I mean, uh, Camille, you brought a pa the package of coffee, um, which looks completely different than maybe what we would typically uh, expect from a coffee brand. Um, can you talk a little bit about how packaging um, is part of this kind of design decision around distinguishing or kind of aligning yourself within specific categories? Yeah, and so it's actually funny because, you know, we've uh, mostly focused on e-commerce for the past, you know, uh, year or so that we've been launched. Um, and and e-commerce was part of this um, strategy around transparency, kind of having this direct discussion with our customers. Um, but packaging was really important for me because uh, you know it's the first thing that people interact with, so it needs to really, really tell a story. Um, so there's two things that this uh, packaging achieves. Um, the first one that is you know it's recyclable glass. Uh, glass does not leach um, chemicals that, that that you know are pretty crazy. One of my best friends studying. Uh, the pesticides and how they can mess up with, with fertility is really, really scary. So glass is really good at that, uh, and it's really good at preserving flavors as well. We've, um, uh, so we've used also kind of like a, this, this main packaging as something that you, you would keep on your counter, and uh, we sell like, you know, refill pouches that are also biodegradable, um, and so it's kind of like a true um, package strategy, if you, if you wish. Uh, but you're right, you know, on the shelves, and we're starting to explore retail, it stands out. Um, it stands out because it's really, really different from, from all, the, all the coffee packages, and, and that's good. You know, it tells the story in itself. I think ours is a pretty stark 
contrast to what's out there too, and that's kind of based off of that first thing that I said of when we launched in Home Depot first, we went for a very utilitarian approach, had to stand up package, which is what Home Depot required, had the image of a fully grown garden on the front of it, and said, hell yeah, we're gonna crush it. So launched in stores and realized that every bag of manure and soil next to us had the same exact thing. So we just looked like a bag of shit, which was just not ideal. So now, uh, literally, so now all of our packages actually... Yeah. New hashtag. New hashtag. Uh, so now all of our packages actually have the meal that the garden will grow on the cover of it. So your Caprese kit, which has tomato and basil, has the aerial shot of basil and tomato sliced up with the balsamic vinegar on top of it. It looks sexy as all hell. <laughs> Yeah, so in consumer packaged goods, I mean, I think if you can think of that milk, dairy, non-dairy space, everything is kind of natural foods, paint by numbers of a splashy pour in a cup with it like coming out the side and pastel colors. And I think any one of us could probably mentally imagine what that is. Oli does something that's very different. Uh, we try to stand out with unorthodox colors and side panels of a, a, a square box where we use the side panel to write like long, it seems like college admission essay uh, style things about what we believe and sometimes just nonsense. Um, and then we keep it really simple on the what we call the boring but very important side of the packaging that, that explains all the ingredients and everything like that. And on the, on the topic of transparency, on our website, I mean, I think food is super shady and a lot of companies, particularly big food companies, don't want you to know where your ingredients and where your food come from. We think that every consumer would be better off if they were thinking more about ingredients and what goes into their food and where it comes from. So we put every single ingredient, like when you go to our, our website and see the product page, it talks about what we think is great and what, not, what, what might be not so great. And we try to imagine what people might have an issue with with any one of our products. And we list, you can click on every single ingredient and not only see what it is, but where we source it from. The state, the, the supplier, everything like that. We put, the, we put our full process up on the website and um, that is a level, level of like radical transparency that you don't typically see in food um, that I think a lot of people give us uh, credit for and it's just kind of core of the belief system for the company. And, and for us, it's, it's a little bit of a balance. Um, so often with, with local product um, or artisan product, you have this sort of crafty look. And we went with that in the beginning and it was good, but we needed to gloss it up a little bit. So we glossed it up, but we also wanted to stay true to the transparency. So we have bright, shiny, gorgeous looking berries on our blueberry package or on our strawberry package. But we also have in big, huge writing, the name of the state where it comes from. So in North Carolina, it says North Carolina blueberries. In Florida, it says Florida blueberries. In New York or New Jersey, New York or New Jersey, in big writing. And the other companies that make frozen produce, it's in small dot matrix print on the bottom of the bag. Um, and then the other part of it is, that once again, going to transparency, we have a picture of our farmers on the front of the bag. The farmers are what we're selling, local produce. One of the things I think is really interesting about all four of your stories is kind of the the entrepreneurial piece of it, like how you guys actually launched to market. Um, uh, both Kim and Camille use Kickstarter. John, I know you're part of the Food Accelerator. Mike, um, I, from what our conversation, I understand you guys really kind of took the the like coffee uh, shop as hub approach. And I wanted to talk a little bit about. Why the why you chose those specific approaches and like what have been the pros and cons of that kind of entry into the marketplace? Anyone can start. John, why don't you start? Sure. So we work with the food accelerator here in New York called um, Food Future Co. We started with North Carolina produce, and so we sold North Carolina produce in North Carolina. But we knew in order to grow, we needed to scale, and ma and really that's when we decided that. To when we look at an accelerator. And so that that model, um, working with the accelerator helped us to create that model and and replicate it in different territories. And then the other part of it was, which is, is hugely important, it takes money to scale. And so the accelerator worked with us about you know, how to raise money. And that was a big deal. Um, putting together our pitch, putting together um, our investor lists, and moving forward, and so that's been very helpful 
working with that with the accelerator? Uh, so there is, th when we were thinking about how to enter the U.S. market, there's literally thousands of retail brands and products that get launched on grocery shelves every single year and fail immediately. Distribution and getting on shelf is only the start of that journey. And so for us thinking about how we would launch something really new, again, oat milk, like leaves people scratching their head a little bit when they first hear about the idea. We really kind of went to like just thinking about product market fit and we have an amazing product that foams really great in coffee and uh, that was an area that was really lacking as we talked to people like uh, they either other alternative plant-based milk dairy alternatives were overly sweet or they didn't foam and if you pay five dollars for a latte at your favorite local coffee shop you want it to taste great and you don't want the fact that you want a non-dairy option to inhibit that and so we really we have very like great patient investors so like we held off a little bit on some quick wins that we probably could have gotten in terms of getting on retail shelves and to try to build the brand through on-premise specialty coffee sales which when you walk into that shop you trust your barista and when that barista says hey we have something new that's in like do you want to try it you like give it a shot and then you associate oat milk and oatly with that and then you see it on shelf at Whole Foods or Fairway and you're more likely to pick it up. And kind of like with Kickstarter and this model, there's also kind of a built-in brand ambassadorship almost. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we really emphasize that like barista training and barista love and support because they are the people for us that do a lot of the heavy lifting of even just getting people to understand what this idea is, which helps us a ton when some, you're asking someone to pay five dollars to buy something and bring it to their home when they see it at grocery stores. Yeah, um, that's the key part in the transition of natural products and organic products becoming more mainstream, is that historically people like natural or organic because they were natural or organic, or because of whatever value you had, it was local. That's no longer enough. Your product can't taste like crap. I mean, it, it's really got to be good. And if somebody's going to pay five bucks for your latte, it's got to taste great. I mean, it's not good enough that our fruit is local. It's got to be great tasting fruit. And that's the change in the, the world of natural products being sold in natural food stores and their local co-ops to now being sold in your conventional supermarkets. Is that people want really great tasting things and they want them to be local or natural or organic or and fully transparent but it all starts doesn't it's not that it all starts it all ends if your product doesn't taste I, I completely agree with that if you work in food like we could be the most sustainable oat milk company in the world solving climate change if it tasted like crap it doesn't matter it's food and beverage and it has to taste great if it doesn't it's a non-starter, you will never succeed. And, and I think that's the benefit of being in the food industry, whether you're doing Kickstarter like we did, or whether or not you're doing an accelerator, and any opportunity that you have to actually get in front of customers, by having a food product, people are going to taste it. You can do samples really easily and determine really, really quickly, and at a low cost, even if you're just doing really tiny samples, and people say this tastes like shit, pivot. <laughs> <laughs> And so just like, I mean, from my opinion, really quick on Kickstarter, it was a great opportunity for us to do just that at a little bit of a greater scale. We hit the local market, realized that people said this is a cool concept. We went on to Kickstarter and got it from a more national market that people believed in the idea, like the concept, that gave us the validation to continue thereafter. And then to Shark Tank. And then Shark Tank, one, two years after that, and about two million coffees. That's really cool. Uh, so um, I, I really agree with everything that, that was said. Uh, so I was actually holding off before uh, launching it cultured um, to find someone that could really bring um, expertise on the flavor and on the food side. You know, so actually my co-founder is, is a flavor um, scientist, and, and you know, it's really like kind of the uh, symbiosis between biotechnology, microbiology, and, 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 and food science that made that made it cultured. So we actually, we actually went through uh, a couple of, of accelerator programs as well. Uh, we went through IndieBio, which is a, uh, a program that focuses on biotech startups, and through tech startups as well. Um, and so we, we, we wanted to launch really quickly, you know, to be exposed to, to the marketplace and get feedback and, and, and understand you know, um, if, if our product would, and our story would really, really resonate with people. So that's why we chose Kickstarter. 
Um, on Kickstarter, you know, what was great for us is that it kind of created a community of evangelists for, for mission. Um, and those people, you know, activated the, the word of mouth and, and all this. And so we've actually been growing mostly on, organically with very, very little marketing budget. So it's mostly word of mouth, PR, you know, and um, that's been really, really great for us. So. And I think as the magazine was also launched on Kickstarter, and I think another piece of that is just kind of the amount of press that kind of pays attention to crowdfunding platforms like that. Um, I'm sure you had that same kind of experience with Future Food Company and Accelerator. Uh, I feel like sometimes when you're launching an idea or a brand or a product that might be a little bit left from center, um, having like a built-in platform with like its own kind of PR machine and marketing machine to support the work that you're doing is a huge boon, especially as like an independent entrepreneur like, you don't necessarily have a press budget or like a marketing budget. We have more PR on the day one of our Kickstarter launch than we've had since getting a deal on Shark Tank. Yeah. So, um, with that piece of advice, does anybody have any questions? Oh. Oh, yeah. We only have time for one question. I saw that hand first. Sorry. Talk to everybody afterwards. <laughs> Hi, I actually had a question about, and this is obvious for some of you, um, but about how climate change either inspired your businesses to develop or how it's affected them since. I mean, I know oat milk, I mean, that's entirely the bag is how dairy um, affects and interacts with climate change. And local produce obviously reduces our reliance on fossil fuels. But I mean, I know coffee is kind of a volatile crop in light of climate change. So I'm just curious if any of you had any other uh, comments on that. Yeah, I mean, you said it. It's a, it's a, it is a core value of our company. Uh, it's really, so many brands could adopt a uh, initiative to say that they're a better for you company or they're trying to do good things to benefit the environment. Like the reason the company exists is to be a part of uh, switching, helping people to shift to a more plant-based diet that in turn will have a positive impact on mitigating the effects of climate change in the food and beverage industry. And I'm going to actually ask the last question, if that's okay. Um, what are what are some of the things, because you guys are all food entrepreneurs, and um, you guys are really kind of paying attention to the space. What are some of the things that you guys are most excited about, whether it's around distribution, around technology, or other kind of competitors in the space that you guys are seeing? What are some trends that you're seeing that you're like, yes, I'm so stoked that this is happening? I think the, the biggest one is, for me is the way that the conventional supermarket world is embracing um, natural and organic products. Um, Walmart's the largest, is the, the largest seller of organic food in the country. Um, and that's really important. And as we look at it with our product, um, we think that local food shouldn't be exclusive. It should be, a local food should be available to everyone. And, and you can only do that through um, being in stores where most people shop. And so so that the conventional world embracing the all natural and organic food market in our local foods is wonderful. And I'd say to kind of piggyback on that and the question on climate change too is just like once you have more people growing their own food at home, you're gonna have less travel miles that food is going. Right now the average bite of food is travels 1,500 miles before it gets to your plate. So if you are actually growing it yourself at home in your backyard, you can measure local and food, not miles. And all the innovations that are going up in the home gardening space are really cool to see, whether it's hydro, aero, soil-based, a rising tide raises all ships, and the water's coming up fast. I would say um, the acquisition market within small, high-growth natural food industries, I, I would say that's super interesting, not from a selfish perspective, but because of some of the acquisitions even recently of Blue Bottle, Chameleon, RX Bar, that brings more talent and focus to different sort of focused, nat small natural food brands because when you see those sort of outcomes coming through the pipe, more talent and more brands take risks which in turn changes our food system away from big food, multinational CPG, who are the ones acquiring, but in the interim, you're having all these amazing products and changes happening at the shelf that wouldn't happen if it were not for that infusion of capital and outcomes. Yeah, and so I have a lot of things to say about sustainability as well, but I guess we can, we can talk after. Um, 
I think for me, um, the, the interface between food and tech itself is really, really interesting. The fact that a lot of companies are realizing that you know consumers are interested to hear about where their, their product comes from, how it's made, and and people are starting to kind of create these communication channels between uh, the technology, the story of the products, and, and the consumers. Yeah, and I just want to answer my own question, which is that I think radical transparency is the thing that I'm most excited about within the food supply chain. Um, technologies like blockchain technology, where they're, and you talked about Walmart, um, they're you know actually using these types of technologies to connect, uh, to basically provide information around where our food actually comes from. And I think design uh, and food entrepreneurs like yourself have a real responsibility to to continue that mission to 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 share that type of radical transparency with consumers. Um, so thank you guys all for staying. Uh, we're going to be around for questions, and thanks to Food Loves Tech.